Okay, we're down in Barrington, Rhode Island, folks, and we're visiting Fred Richardson and his uh, longtime home here in Barrington. And uh, we're going to be talking today about all of his railroad experiences, uh, both as a boy and later on uh, at Edaville and Steamtown. And uh, we're going to have a great time here, I'm sure. Fred, thank you so much for having us come down here today. You're welcome. We really appreciate it. And uh, you have a lovely home filled with mementos, and it's a joy to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're going to go through a list of questions that we've worked up, and if you're uncomfortable with any of it, let us know, and if you want to expound on any of it, again, feel free to do it. It's just kind of an outline. Uh, we'll start out by asking where you were born, and when, and uh, where you were brought up in grade school, that sort of thing. I was born in Meredith, New Hampshire, June the 8th, 1917, and the reason I was born up there in New Hampshire is because my grandfather's a medical doctor. We had lived here in Rhode Island for the most part, but we went up to New Hampshire for the delivery, and I call it was for rural free delivery. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, although my main residence was here in Rhode Island, I spent a lot of time up in New Hampshire. Every summer I was up there, a lot of vacations. And uh, what was very, very wonderful for me was that uh, the local railroad men befriended me. Mm -hmm. and, and so by the time I was... 15 or so, they, I'd ridden in the locomotives and so forth and become what, once the railroad boat hits you, it usually hits pretty hard. Right. And especially, it was easy for me because these men, I could ride on top of the caboose, I could ride in the engine. In those days, they weren't afraid of litigation. Right. And we could do anything that was reasonable. Mm -hmm. And so the hobby developed uh, pretty rapidly in New Hampshire. Even though I lived for the most part in Rhode Island, went to public schools here, right in Barrington, mm -hmm. the first 12 grades. Okay. And then after uh, graduating from high school, I went to Brown University four years. And in those days, the trains were running. So, and I lived at home of necessity to, to, to save the money from dormitory and sure. so forth. And, and so I rode into, from here to uh, Providence on the train every day. Mm -hmm. and, and <clears throat> uh, so my education was at Brown uh, University, and I've been asked, well, what did I plan to do when I got out? Well, I planned to work for the railroad. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it didn't work out that way uh, <clears throat> because when I graduated in 1939, the Depression wasn't over yet. What, what bailed this country out of the Depression was World War II. Correct. We, we, we were the arsenal of democracy before we got involved in the war. The war started September the 1st, 1939, in Europe. And the reason I remember that was because I graduated from Brown University in 19, June of 1939. At 12 o'clock, the ceremonies were over. At 1 o'clock, I was paddling ice. And the reason for that was that Nelson Brown and I had planned to write another book. We had written a book along the Iron Trail. So we intended to spend a year getting photographs going all over the country to make preparations for the book. So we're going to work hard all summer at the ice plant. That's why I was down there. Pedal, I pedal, in those days, there were a lot of ice boxes. Right. I pedal ice house to house. Did a lot of wholesale delivery. And so this, everything went beautiful until Nelson Blount got hit by diving into shallow water, running into some glass that left over from the 1938 hurricane. And so now he can't do anything for about a month. And this put the kibosh on the whole plan to go around and make preparation for another book. We put a name to the book, Steam, Steel, and Streamliners was going to be. So now here I am. I worked all summer. I turned down opportunities for jobs. Now I'm out of work. Mm -hmm. So I found out that 
a browning shop in Providence was looking for somebody to work in the traffic department. So that's how you asked what my first full-time job was. I had part-time jobs peddling ice for a long time, for a number of years. The first full-time job was at Brown and Sharp in Providence in the traffic department. Okay. Can we back up a minute? Um, yeah. You wrote the book with Nelson. How did you meet Nelson in the first place? Well, that's an interesting story. My father was a school teacher. He taught science at Hope Street High School in, in Providence. So, st staying out of bunking school was a no-no in my family. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no-no. Right. But <clears throat> the Royal Scot came to America in, in May 1933. And by that time, I'm pretty interested in railroads, and this was a much heralded event. So, uh, I. First time in my life I bunked school and went up there to Providence. And uh, lo and behold, who's up there but Nelson Blount, unbeknownst to me. I knew who he was, we went to the same school. Okay. I was two years ahead of him in school. And But <clears throat> what are you doing up here? Well, I'm interested in railroads. And so that began a lifelong friendship and it started when the Royal Scot came to America. Okay. And did you at that at that point in your life, is that when you decided to get together and put out the book along the Oh, no, 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 no. That the, came afterwards. Yeah, that, the, the book came out in, in 1938. This okay. was 1933. So it was another so, five years. Well, but in the meantime, the railroad men in Providence were, for the most part, with a few notable exceptions where we got chased out, but for the most part were very, very cooperative. Mm -hmm. And the, the men in the signal towers, we were allowed to go up in the signal towers. Uh, all of them, there were three in Providence at that time, Brayton Avenue, um, uh, Promenade Street, and Orm Street. So th these people became very fr friends to us. And, and, and now we joined the Engine Picture Club. You okay. ever hear of that? Yes. Was it, it was in Railroad it's Stories. The railroad, railroad Magazine, yeah, yes. Yes, so, so it was called Railroad Stories. In those us. days, yeah. yeah. And so, 15 cents. Right. <laughs> so. You could put an ad in there for nothing. I still got a lot of them. F.H. Richardson, 29 Third Street, Desires B and M for and that's when we really got into more and more photographs and, and became stronger and stronger in our interest in railroads. Okay. Is that how you came across the name of Lawrence Breed Walker? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I think he saw my name in the cars but he was in Wolfboro a lot in those days, and I was up in Meredith a lot in those days. And they, they went far apart, right, right. opposite ends of Lake. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so I corresponded with him got a, for probably a year or so. Never met him, mm -hmm. never talked to him, but we had this correspondence. And, so, and he had some pictures, you know, that really interested me. Then years later I found out about the foundation in his name. Right, right. Um, as you you and Nelson, uh, your friendship got closer and you started to put out this, or with the idea of putting out this book, I read in, in I think, The Man from Steamtown that railroads would send you a lot of publicity glossies. Well, the reason they sent us a lot of publicity because we wrote to them and we inferred that we were writing a book. Right, I remember <laughs> reading that. And somebody told you, well, you better go down and go out and write the book if well, you're going to be getting these I, pictures. I, yeah, well, the, the mail kept coming in with all these pictures from American Locomotive, from Baldwin Locomotive, and, and, and from the Main Central Railroad. And our folks got, what's all this about? And we told them, and, and both families were very moral, you know. Right. And you, you're going under false pretenses, you got to send them back or write a book. Right, right. <laughs> so we wrote the book. Now, when you actually decided you were going to do that as a publication, did you have to go out and find a publisher first, or did you write the thing and hope well, to find one later? No, what, what we did was Nelson Blount had a, a member of his family, a remote member of his family, that, that ran a, a engraving plant up in Greenfield, Mass. Mm -hmm. and, and so they did all our engravings. Okay. But, and then they, being in, in that business, knew and recommended the uh, title 
publishing up in Rutland. That's how that happened. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, how was that book marketed, or even before that, how was it financed as far as... Well, we financed it. it, it the whole thing cost about $2,000. Oh, so it wasn't the amount... It was $500. I remember some of it. $500 for Mohawk engraving. Then we had... A, Nelson and I each raised 500 bucks for money we didn't peddle in ice. Right, which was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of money. Yeah. So, so, so we put up 500 apiece. And then Tuttle Publishing, if I remember correctly, was willing to go ahead on the basis there'd be enough sales so we could pay them what they should have, which all happened. Right, right. So, so it was self-financed. What was the press run, do you remember? Yeah, 2,100. 2, 2,100 copies. Yeah. Now, other than this book, I think the only real rail fan books that had ever come out at all at this era were stuff from Lucius Beebe. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure which title came first, but some of those ones like High Iron. I want to show you something. Okay. There's a along the Iron Trail. Oh, are we still on? Yep. Along the Iron Trail was the first book out that was 100% for rail fans. Well, lots of books, but they were history mm -hmm. yep. and so forth. And so the, the Railroad Magazine, Freeman Hubbard, you must have heard oh, that yes. name. Oh, yeah. Well, we had known him personally because we'd been down there trying to get some help from pictures. <laughs> and so he knew that Lucius Beebe had this book coming out. So he said, you guys hurry up, you'll be the first one. And we, were, we beat him by, by only three months. Okay. They both came in 38. So uh, and then after us, he wrote many, many right. farmers. But during that time of 38, Lucius Beebe, so he knew that we were getting ours out too. Right. Huh? So I, I've got this autograph thing to Frederick H. Richard, 1938. That's great. So you actually predated him by three months. Yeah, with that about book. three months. Because <clears throat> yeah. I'm sure the press run was probably different. Oh yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. That's a great, that's a great story. We'll have to get that uh, inscription uh, yes. later on because that's worth having. Um, Basically, did you know pretty soon after it was published that this was going to be a really popular book, as, as, as popular as it became? No, we're afraid that, that we're going to lose our thousand yeah. bucks, to be honest. But what happened was that the, the marketing was done by Title Publishing Company that mm -hmm. they sent out. And, and we had a brochure. You, you got a copy of uh, yeah. it, I think, right? which we made ourselves and, and mailed them out. Right. And... So what we found out was that right off the bat, the, the many, many libraries picked up the book. Okay. We had a list. Some of them would buy six or eight copies, of, you know, because it was a library. And so now after they got distributed some, then we sold out. Well, we finally sold out completely. The, the last... 400 copies Nelson and I mailed from this house. We, we went up to Rutland, picked up the last books that mm -hmm. were there, mm -hmm. put an ad in real for two bucks. Huh? We cut the price yeah. and sold them out. Now, now you know, they're 25 30 dollars. Oh, at least, yeah. 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 And actually, it was reprinted, what, in 1966? Yeah, it was, it was reprinted by Tuttle. And a, a, a chapter was added to it yep. that, that brought up to date the right. things that had happened. Right. And so, and the second run uh, was sold out too. Now, how many how many copies uh, of that I, second I, run? I've forgotten how many it was. I used to know, but I've forgotten. And the time, I had a fire in 1954 in the house and got cleaned out, so I had zero books myself. Oh, ah, okay. Either one. Right. But friends of mine, you know, that had some. copies. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. Nelson had some and his wife and so forth. That's a great story. Yeah. Um, other than that book and chasing trains or whatever, did you and Nelson have anything else in common in those days, or was it strictly the railroad hobby? Well, the railroad hobby consumed most of our time. Mm -hmm. What we had in common, we, being in the Depression, we had the work, work ethic. Right. And, uh, you know, the four-letter word then was W-O-R-K. <laughs> right. And so, so we worked together. We worked together at the ice plant. Mm 
you know. So that was in common. We spent hours uh, stacking ice at the... Uh, see, Nelson's father built a plant that manufactured ice. Okay, so it was he, his used family. To cut ice, used to cut ice, natural ice, <clears throat> and what happened was that sometimes in this, the, the, the uh, wouldn't be enough ice to last, uh, you know, a warm winter wouldn't be enough ice. Right. So he had to buy ice from Lake Winnipesaukee and it came down here in railroad cars. I've unloaded, helped unload ice out of railroad cars back in the early 30s. And so he decided to build his own plant. Mm -hmm. Now they call it artificial ice, right? And that burned him up. He says, not ice is ice, it's H2O frozen. So he called it manufactured ice. I, I still got my, my uh, shirt that I had said W.E. Blount manufactured ice on the back. I could show it to you. But, but any, anyway, so now what happens is that in the spring you start making ice and storing it because you can't make it fast right. enough to satisfy the customers right. in the summer. So they had this big cold storage where well, it was kept about 20 degrees, 25, and it, you could, ice would go up seven tiers, seven tiers. So the, the first tier, you just drag it in there. There's 300 pound blocks, you're probably familiar with. Oh, yeah. So we drag them in there. Then, then the next tier, we put them up by hand. Each one, had, we were strong in those days because we were peddling ice all the time. Oh, yeah. So we, we could pick, them. Now, now we've got two tiers high. After that, you got to do it with a tongs, with, with mechanic. Right. So one guy would be down below, and the other guy would be up on the second tier. You raise it up, and you pull it in. We, we, we had uh, rubbers with, with cleats on them. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and so the reason I mention this is, of course, while we're in there, you, you know, we were talking all the time about not only railroads, but things that we had a common interest in. And so, now Nelson says, we'll do two blocks at a time, which everybody thinks won't happen. Well, you put the tongue in, now it slips like this. Right. Yeah, so everybody figured it would slip off. So he said, well, let's try it. And so, now it worked. Now we can stack ice twice as fast as anybody else. Right. And the reason we wanted to do it, his father said, it was a little lot across the street from the ice plant. He said, if you, when you guys are all finished, you can take the time off and go up there and, and play football. So now we could finish earlier than anybody. They could never figure it out. We'd hear somebody coming, we'd just do one. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but so, so the reason I mentioned that, Nelson was very observant and, and was able to, to recognize opportunities such as that right. all his life. Right, I could see that from yeah. reading the book. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, came along World War II. Now, yeah. he apparently was going to join the Navy but was declared 4F. Yeah, he was in 4F because he had had unknown fever mm -hmm. and he couldn't take the shots because they had a terrific reaction, so he was rejected. Right. And you were in the Coast Guard. Yeah, I, I was working at Brown and Shop, as I said, which, which was <coughs> the national defense industry. So I, I was deferred because I was in this national defense. Now, I had this little boat across the river. A friend of mine was pretty good mechanically inclined. I got the thing going, inboard motor. We came up to Crescent Park here, the thing conked out. And so, the the uh, we were just about to come ashore at a dock there, and uh, the Coast Guard was there. They had a little cutter there, and the guy said, "How's that? You in trouble?" He said, "Yeah, the the thing won't run. Don't tie up," he said. "If you tie up, we can't help you. But now you're in distress. We'll help you where you're going." So they towed me up to where I was going. It was about supper time, so I said, "Come down and eat with us." Now the guy says. You know, you're a college graduate, you're eligible to become an officer, and there's this terrific program, and I got to thinking about it, and here I am in foot, uh, deferred, but there was a lot of patriotism. Sure, oh yeah. So I figured, you know, I should be serving, 
draw applied and I got in, mm -hmm. and that's how I got into the Coast Guard. And what year was that? That was in 1942. Uh, 42, okay. Yeah. We got in, got in the war uh, December 7th. 41, yeah. right. So while you were in the Coast Guard, where were you primarily stationed and doing what? Well, the first year you, you, you go apprentice seaman, mm -hmm. and, and then four weeks at the academy. That's a, a three months, I mean, total of four months, during which time there's not one overnight liberty, not one for four months. At the end, I graduated in the middle of the winter. It was one of the coldest winters we ever had. I was trained for anti-submarine patrol. We did a little of it out here. And so one time, if I remember right, it was 17 degrees below zero. I was hoping I would die, you know. So, so they said, you can, after it was 200 of us graduated, and you can pick any of the eight naval districts that you want to be in. And so it was only three of us that got the one we picked, because everybody picked their own hometown. Oh, sure. So I picked the furthest one south, which is the eighth naval district, New Orleans. So, so I, I spent the early part of the war in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally familiar with with all the places what? we see on TV sure. now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Did you ever see any enemy action at all during the war? No, I never did. I, I was slated. The closest I came, we, we an anti-submarine, we're pretty sure that, that we had spotted a, uh, a German submarine. But, that, but the, we're not sure. We dropped a depth bomb. But, but when I get to New Orleans, uh, now I, I'm assigned to an LST mm -hmm. landing ship, you know. Yep. I got there, the ship wasn't built yet. It was, you know, right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. It, was, it all Typical, came out. So, yeah. so they don't know what they could do with me. So I went to any aircraft school for a week. Then I was assigned to this job and that job, waiting for the ship to be built. Now in the meantime, out in San Francisco, Port Chicago, but it was San Francisco. They're loading these bombs and they had an explosion. So now the government says, you know what? Somebody's going to be in charge of all this loading of bombs. And so, aha, it'll be the Coast Guard. So now we've got to have a guy that's in charge of this for every district in America. So everybody thought that would be a good job. The guy that I worked, VZ, he was from Washington. They were all politicking, trying to get the job, and I was trying to help him what little influence I had. All at once they said, Richardson, it's you. <laughs> so, so, so I went to Washington, went to school, learned all about this stuff, and now I come down to, to New Orleans, and, and, and I'm the explosive officer, and we loaded in three places, two south, uh, Braithwaite and Concord Switch, and one north for gasoline. And uh, so they, they were far from town cases and explosion, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. And so that that was my responsibility. Uh, I was, I, it was only supposed to be temporary, but two or three things happened. First thing happened was th they sent people down to take my place so I can go in the LST. Mm -hmm. And the commanding officer I looked at him and looked at me, no influence on my part, and he put them on the LST and I stayed there. Well, that happened two, three times, you know, and so now it got, came about that I stayed there in that job for the full length of the war. Were you happy about that? Yeah, I, I was happy about it because I knew what I was doing. I, I was very confident in, in what was going on because I, I was very diligent. I studied the book. I, I knew the uh, the rules and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I and nobody else was confident on that particular job. Right. And, and, and the reason I know that every third night, or not less than every fourth night, officers at the captain of the port office went on duty at eight, eight in the morning got off 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. We're, it'll be there all night. Mm -hmm. And so, you had a petty officer watch every eight hours. 
we can go sleep. <clears throat> they wake you up if there's something. And they, they, these guys told me, most of us said, don't wake me up. I said, if there's any doubt, wake me up because I'm responsible. You won't be doing a favor. If I'm sleeping there, don't know what something happened and I should have done so. So I have good rapport with these guys. That's good. But, so now, every once in a while, it'll be a problem at night. And, and <clears throat> so, if it was explosive problem, the other guys didn't know what they could do, you know? Right. That, that's why I had confidence in and, and I'll give you an example. What happened was, what, what we would do, and one reason I was called, because I had this shipping experience, a railroad experience, Every 10,000 ton vessel was loaded with bomb took 176 railroad cars. Mm -hmm. It was all railroad. Mm -hmm. And so now what we would do is you go down the port of embarkation. I represent the Coast Guard. They represent the Army. We draw a storage plan. It's about taking hours. We agree on it. That's all set. Now that's what we're going to do. Well, every once in a while, they want to change the storage plan. Well, if you don't know the regulations, you don't know how to do it. Sure. Well, as I say, I was very, very conscientious about it. So, I knew. so one night I, I got the duty, and 10 o'clock at night the call comes in, and they say, we want to change. So they want to change where they're going to put the detonators. They're going to be changed. So, so I said, can you do it? I said, no. Yeah, no, okay. Half hour later, another guy calls. Same thing. Only the third guy calls. He says, I said, no. I said, well, you can sign a waiver. They, they won't put permission from us, but the regulation, they could sign a waiver, and they didn't want to do it. So I refused. And the guy, you know who I am? I said, no. He said, I'm vice president of like steamship line. So, and he said, yeah, and you're going to be out of that job tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know? So, so uh, I t told the commanding officer, he's an ex-Navy man, tough, tough guy. And he, I thought he should know about it. Sure enough, they call up. And, and, and you, could, you could hear him in the next, you can, anytime he's on the phone, you can hear him two blocks down the street. And what I remember, if you ever threaten another officer on my command, you're going to be in a lot more. <laughs> so, so the guy would support you if yeah. you're right. Yeah, that's good. If you're wrong, watch out. We're talking about World War II and you being in the Coast Guard and what your jobs were. And I understand you met your wife while you are in the Coast Guard. How did that come about? Yeah. Early on, the spas started to come in to replace the men for sea duty. So my wife was one of them, and, and uh, one look at her, you can tell she's a super gal. And so what happened was that after a little while, uh, we started dating. That usually didn't happen because I was an officer, she was enlisted, and mm -hmm. so forth. No fraternizing. But, but there didn't get to be a problem with it. So we got... Our first date was in May, and we got engaged in June. We got married in July. Wow. And so everybody says, you know, that's bad news because you don't know enough about him. But the person I lost to was a friend of mine. In fact, he'd been my roommate for a while, so I had access to all her records. So I knew a lot about her. <laughs> so, so, so the commanding officer, Commander Shorty, he was a tough Navy man. So one day he calls Richardson, yes sir, come in here. He says, this girl says, you're going to marry her. She had to get permission from him during mm -hmm. war time. He said, uh, uh, are your intentions good? And I remember saying, I'm planning to marry her. How much better can the intentions be than that? So we had his blessing on it. Right. And uh, we did get married in uh, July, and our son was born in August, a year later, in the Marine Hospital. We had thought that I'd be long gone by then, but because of the importance of the explosive detail in the commander's eyes and the fact that he was confident that I was doing a good job, that's how I stayed there. I see.
And what was her job in the Coast Guard? Well, she, she was Yeoman Second Class. Well, she, that's a word for secretary. Secretary, yeah. right. I'm aware yeah, of that. She yeah. was secretary and a good one. And then she got a medical discharge when she was pregnant. Otherwise, she would have been a chief, uh, you know, so because she was on the way up. Okay. She's very, very good at what she did. And the reason she was in was because she had two sisters and a brother. The brother was in 4F because he had had serious, serious medical problems. And so she felt that somebody in the family should represent, be representing the military. Mm -hmm. And so that speaks well of her. She was patriotic and Absolutely. did it uh, to, to do uh, what she thought was necessary for any patriotic citizen. Right. So she came down with, with, with that in mind. And when she's assigned to our office, then one thing led to another, as I just stated. Sure. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's a great story. Yeah. Um, did you get out as soon as World War II ended? No, I didn't. What happened was, when the war was over, you could get out on a point system. Right. If you had so many points, I had enough points to get out. But now, they wouldn't let me out because now we've got to unload all this stuff. It's not coming back, mm -hmm. these bombs. Mm -hmm. And so, an interesting thing happened. Nelson Blount had a lot of political clout. He was very close to Senator Green in Rhode Island. And Rip Higgins was Senator Green's assistant, did most of his planning and so forth. And he'd do anything that Nelson wanted to have done, almost. So one day they called me up into the Commandant's office. And Sir Richardson, he said, there's somebody up in Rhode Island just trying to use a lot of p political influence to get you out. Now, you, we know you got enough points, but we don't want you. And so what I want you to do is call them up and tell them if they don't lay off of that, we'll keep you in the <laughs> two months longer. <laughs> so, so the, 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 and I said, I didn't even know it. Right. it, it we, we, know, we know it's not coming from you, right. but that, that was an interesting thing. So, so I told Nelson that I'd be working for him in May of 19. 46. Okay. And so, questions? He, in the meantime, had started a seafood business, right, and supplied the military with seafood? Yes, yeah, I'll tell hogs. you how that happened. He was in 4F. <laughs> he was got very, very effective entrepreneur, much more so effective as a salesman than his father. So he got contracts with the Army for ice. Camp Edwards would buy ice by the trailer truck load. In fact, I took a trailer like down there, my, I had the trailer truck driver's license, and uh, before I got in the service, and so the down there, the, the procurement officer, purchasing agent, in other words, was very very friendly to Nelson. He, he admired the way that he was handling things, so he said, "You know what? We we want to buy some oysters. You know where we can get some oysters." Well, the Blount family had been in the oyster business since 1980, but the 38 hurricane wiped out the in industry here at Narragansett Bay. But he was familiar with the oyster companies and so forth. So he said, well, I'll get back to you. So he found out, he went up to Salty Sea, found out he could buy oysters for X dollars a gallon. Mm -hmm. And then he adds 50 cents to it. And, yep, we'll buy. so they were buying hundreds and hundreds of gallons every month, every one at 50 cent markup. So pretty soon he's making two or three hundred dollars a week, which is a big, big money there. You know? And that led to now he's into, back into the seafood business, and it led to other things because when it was seen that he was marketing seafood, that then other companies wanted to do business with him. And other government agencies as well. So that, that's how we made the transition from the ice business into the seafood business. And then he went uh, at some point and, and got into a, a contract with Campbell Soup, is that correct, to supply? Yeah, that, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in the early, now by that time, I'd come to work for him. Okay. Blount Seafood was formed in 1946. I, I'm the only person alive that was here on day one of Blount Seafood. It was a merger of three companies, Plymouth Packing, which I started, from Mr. Uran, 
Yep. Was, 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 was in there. And the E.B. Blount Sons, which had been dormant, had been active from 1980 till 1938, now became active again. And then Narragansett Bay Packing Company, which properties where Blount Seafood is now, Nelson bought cheap after the hurricane damage. Mm -hmm. And so, so those three, three companies were merged into Blount Seafood in 1946. Okay, and from there on, you were working with them at that company? Yeah, yeah. Before, for, see, I'd worked for Nelson's father in the ice business. Right. Then I worked for Nelson at the Plymouth Packing Company in Plymouth. Oh, he put me in charge over there. Okay. Uh, you know, I didn't know a heck of a lot about it, just got out of the service. Right. But I learned some administrative skills in the service. Sure. So that worked out pretty well. Then I could see that that was poor because... Over there, we were only working three days a week. Over in Warren, they were working three days a week. Mm -hmm. And what they did was <clears throat> process these clams, cohogs, they were, send them over to us, and we'd pack them in number one picnic size tins, which is Campbell's soup size. Okay. So we had this machinery all over there. But the problem was, he'd throw this all in big vats, put them in the freezer. The outside would be frozen solid, the inside would wouldn't be frozen at all, so I had to throw a lot away. Mm. And so I told him, this is, this is ridiculous. We should move everything we got in Plymouth and bring it over to Warren. Then everybody would be working six days a week. Right. Did it day three and week three. Right. And we do away with all that transportation cost, sure. and we'd have fresh stuff. Right. So Nelson thought that was good. So we did it. That's how Blount Seafood was started. Plymouth Packing Company was no longer. Right. So although I worked there a few months, then, uh, I soon came part of Blount Seafood. Mm -hmm. well, as the seafood business rolled along, uh, Nelson became quite wealthy at, at yeah, what he was doing. Yeah, he, he became, it, it was hard beginnings. He had, during the war, I mentioned three or four times, he was a terrific entrepreneur. He could buy and sell. He was a terrific salesman, you know, uh -huh. and he was buying trucks because trucking companies were going out of business. Right. So he owned about uh, 16 or 17 trailer trucks, which we, he kept in use one way or another. Right. And the first year we, the, the Blount Seafood, we, we got, you asked about Campbell's Soup, how did we get going there? Well, E.B. Blount's sons had done business with them a lot, and so Nelson's uncle who was vice president of, of Blount Seafood, knew the Campbell people, and so <clears throat> they had a lot of confidence in him, and they wanted to have him buy shell stock, clams in the shell, and we ship them down there in a railroad car. Okay. Now, now, after a while, then the time, the only time that they, they were processing is the winter time because all summer they're into tomatoes. Mm -hmm. All their equipment is into tomatoes, and so what the Campbell did was get other types of soup to keep their plants busy in the winter time, and, and clam chowder was one of them. So when they're buying the clams, is the worst time of the year weather-wise, and the highest price because. They were harder to get yeah, yeah. in bad weather. So what would happen is they would go down there at Campbell's Soup, plan in their production line to put up Campbell's Soup next Tuesday mm -hmm. and Wednesday. Next Tuesday, there's been a, a freeze-up up here of, of big gales. There's no clams. They got all the other stuff ready and, and no clams. So Nelson and I went down and told him, what you ought to do is buy the clams all summer, freeze them, right? And, and then in the wintertime, you just take them out of storage, and there's triple advantage to it, which is obvious to them. They thought that was a good idea. So, so now, the only competitor we had was our customer, because they were still buying shell stock, mm -hmm. processing it. We, we were doing the same here, and so, we thought and suggested, why are they competing with themselves? Yeah. Yep. And over time, the big companies move slow. Right. 
but over time we we were doing well we had many customers and we had snow and mm -hmm. uh, Heinz I've been to Heinz many times Pittsburgh you know right. and so finally Campbell soup says we want a hundred percent of your production and so that, that's a tough one to Anybody tell you don't put all your eggs in one basket? Yeah. Well, Nelson considered it, and we talked it over. And he said, yeah, that's okay. I'll tell you three advantages. Number one, you need no sales force. Mm -hmm. Number two, you need no advertising. Yeah. And number three, there's no bad debts. True. So as long as we're both on the same page, it worked beautiful. So the last years of Nelson's lifetime, we had just the one customer. I see. So that really did. Work did he up. make money? Yeah. yeah, he made money. But but meantime, he gotten into other things too. Right. Right. And so, for the fifth time, I mentioned he was a terrific entrepreneur. And they, they used to say he'd fall in, in, in the ditch and come up gold plated. You right. know the old right. expression. Yeah. So so money seemed to be not too hard for him to, to amass. Right. Okay. Let's jump from him developing his companies and, and into the 1950s and after Ellis Atwood was killed in the explosion down there, how did Nelson get interested in taking Edaville Railroad on? Okay, when you mention explosion, I'm quick to add, it, w it wasn't a steam engine. No. It, it, was, a, it was a boiler was explosion a in the screen house. Right. Right. Okay, now, now how did he get interested? Mr. Uran, who had been Nelson's business partner, He'd been with him with the Plymouth Packing Company. He had a big interest in Nelson. Mr. Rand didn't have any children. He looked at Nelson almost like one of his children. He really befriended him, wanted to bring him along. Mm -hmm. And so he told him that the, the, the state would want to sell Edaville. And because he was the uh, chief operating officer of the co op, Ocean Spray, which he had started. Mm -hmm. The, that he was very friendly with Mrs. Atwood and the people running the park. So he said, Nelson, when the time is right, I'll tell you, and you can go down there and buy it. Well, it took a year or two, but then when Mr. Ant had done all the preliminary work, but then Nelson went down, and I went with him, and we made arrangements with them uh, to buy. We bought the railroad, but not, but the, not land. the land under right. it. Right. We leased the land under it, right. which was a, a you know, Achilles heel that bothered everybody from that time on. Right. Yeah. You must have felt like you died and gone to heaven when you fell into this railroad. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, it was it was great. And I know that um, the early years, what fifty five, fifty six, when you first had the railroad, yeah. and, and that's when they were trying to bring in some standard gauge equipment. Was that the point when the idea of Steamtown was germinating, or, or was that just a coincidence? No, that was the idea of preserving locomotives. Mm -hmm. Steamtown wasn't thought of for some time afterwards. Okay. Be, because Nelson was acquiring locomotives faster than we could accommodate them. Right. right. And, and uh, a lot of them came to Edaville. You know, the Godshaw engines. And the, the, a lot of them went down there on display. And finally, and then Nelson could see that he had to have some other place, place in it because we were six miles from the nearest railhead. That's right. Yeah. So it was tough to get the stuff in there. Very tough. Yeah. Getting tougher because the, the, the transportation, you know, over the highways, you were getting, they didn't go for it. It was too, a lot of weight for some of the bridges. Right. Yeah. right, right. So they were taking a dimmer view of it. So what happened? Also in the early days of, of your both working at Edaville and, and running it as a, as a operation that you had control over, a lot of changes were made, obviously. I can remember being down there as a teenager and seeing, you know, some of the improvements and some of the things that went on. Um, a lot of the, um, I guess, cosmetics, we'll, we'll call them, uh, people disagreed with, like, the big diamond smokestacks and the yeah. big box headlights. Whose idea was all that? Well, uh, well Nelson liked that. He liked that, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's his rarity can do what he wants. So 
his brother was in the shipbuilding business and was an iron worker, so he hired him to make all those fake stacks. Okay. The first one to come off was number seven. Right. <laughs> and what did you personally think of that sort of well, thing? I wasn't very happy with him, yeah. you know, but because it, what was wrong with the way the engines looked when they were running up at the Sandy River and exactly. up in, you Bridgeton. know, yeah. and so, and some were painted red, white, and blue, remember yeah. that? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and all the yeah. Yeah. all the bright yellow cars. Yeah. So 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 gradually we could see that that wasn't the best way to go, and, and we turned to a regular railroad. Right. Yeah. Now the chicken barbecue that was probably as famous as the trains uh, down in Edenville. Well, I, I yeah, can some that. say that. I think the trains were much more. <laughs> Trains were more fun, but yeah. the chicken barbecue seemed to be a big hit with everybody. Yeah, they, they had a guy there who was very good at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one of the things that would bring people to either one of them. It was reasonable to go there oh, in those yeah. days. Yeah. yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. for a very small price, you, you were there all day. Yeah. You got the train ride. Right. You got the museum. Yeah. You got all the things that were on display on the grounds. Yeah, when it went up to two dollars, everybody thought that was horrible. Oh yeah, <laughs> they need to go look at it now. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, I have very fond memories of that myself, and, and yeah. we met many times. We went down there and enjoyed it so much. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyway, the the steam town idea, as you just mentioned, came along a little bit later than that. Yeah, came, well, first came Pleasure Island. Right. That was the stepping stone for Steamtown. Right. Now, how did that come about? Well, the Bill Hawks, who owned uh, Child Life magazine, <laughs> and, and was the owner of it, I think. Yes, that's right. He, he, he was a terrific entrepreneur, too. He, uh -huh. he, he could sell ice to the Eskimos, I think. And, and so he had this concept of a theme park a junior theme park to, to Disney World. Right, I remember here. that at the time. And so he came to Nelson and said, we're going to need a train like Disney World has got and mm -hmm. so forth, the U.N. rest and so forth. And the two hit it off, right? And, and so um, Bill put it across, got the thing going. And uh, so now it was decided to have a bunch of locomotives on display. The active two-foot gauge railroad, which was about a mile up That's there. That's right, yep. And uh, so uh, we started, as Nelson was buying locomotives, they wouldn't come to Edenville, they'd go there, and some of what was in Edenville went up there. So now there's a collection getting started up there, and it was it was right on the rail. The Boston and Maine served that. Right. Okay. So, so that was a natural. Right. Yeah, I remember we went there a day in June within the first week that it opened, and because yeah. it was still kind of rough, they hadn't got all the landscaping finished, but, you know, you could see the potential there. Yeah. And the so-called Engine City, which yeah. is where all the standard gauge locomotives were parked, right. had just been finished. I mean, you could still see that the hot top was still warm yeah, you know, exactly. on the sidewalks. And, of course, there's the 3713 right out front, and yeah. looked like it just had been, you know, running the week before. Yeah, was ready that, to go. Was that fresh? Yeah. You know, coal still in the tender, yep. ashes in the firebox. Yeah. How did he get the 3713? How much did they charge him for that? Do you remember? Yeah, it was a gift. It was? Yeah. Okay, so it was... But meantime, McGinnis had become a member of the board at Edithville. Oh, really? He, he was very friendly with, with Nelson. I didn't know and that. And they had become very close, and... and Early on, it looked to him like Nelson would be a key to getting more business from Ocean Spray. Uh, cranberry juice is about one third sugar. You probably oh, know sure. that. And and so they, E and M was handling through connections a lot of sugar for Ocean Spray, but a lot of it was going to competing lines. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, he never said this, but I think one reason that he befriended Nelson, he would help him to get more. Substantially more cargo business from Ocean Spray, and, and another Nelson is very personable, sure. and uh, so they got to be a very close relationship there. Oh, I have no idea. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the time that he got the thirty-seven thirteen, the six twenty-two, which is an 080, was also yeah. in snow melting duty in Boston. Yeah. Why did he pass on that? Uh, I, I don't really know. I, I mentioned earlier off the record that, that uh, neither Nelson or I were very 
gung ho on switch engines. Right. We, we wanted road engines. Sure. Uh, and so, and Nelson had money, but not endless amounts. Some of the stuff was being donated. Right. You know. Right. And and so, uh, as long as donations are coming in. Uh, He's not interested in buying stuff. Sure. He's getting more than we can handle. And if you started over. buying things, people wouldn't donate anything yeah. anymore. We got donations even from Mexico. Right. We spent a, a two or three trips to Mexico in the Yucatan and so forth to, to get and and get, got some pretty good uh, help from them. Right. Right. Um, the diesel that ended up at Pleasure Island, thirty-eight fourteen, which yeah. I believe was an E seven. Yeah. Was that part of the deal, or was that a whole separate thing from somebody else? Yeah, I don't remember that. Mm. You, I, I see the question. Of, I, I never, in those days especially, I was very disinterested in diesels. Right. <laughs> you know, so, so I don't remember that. Yeah, because I know when it all moved out of there, uh, after a couple of years, that did not go. It was scrapped, and I yeah. often wondered why. Yeah, I don't know. Why they let that go, because yeah. today that would have been as interesting as... Exactly, yeah. 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 It, was it was a thing. transition piece. Fred, about 1961 or two, the uh, engine collection moved out of Pleasure Island and they, they moved it up to North Walpole, New Hampshire, to the old Boston and Main Yards and, and engine house. Now, did did uh, you people lease that from the B&M or did you buy it from the B&M? How did that work? No, early on, uh, it might have been a lease for a short period. Early on, that was bought out, right? Okay, so yeah. you guys actually owned yeah, that. Yeah, owned it. We guys mean Nelson Blanc. Right. Okay. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> okay. Um, at the same time, uh, 61, I believe it was, they started running a tourist train out of Bradford up as far as Sunapee. That's and, correct. And they had the Canadian National uh, Tank Locomotive, number right. 47, running on that. Yeah. I remember that very well because I rode it three yeah. or four times. I drove up I remember up it because I ran it. You ran it, yeah. and it was a great thing. And then all of a sudden, it stopped in midsummer. Yeah. What happened? Technicality. Mm -hmm. It was a Canadian locomotive. It didn't have blueprints that were properly identified in America. And so it was a technicality involved, and they have to follow the law. Sure. And it was a, a big blow to Nelson. Oh, yes. He felt bad about it. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah. And that was a very scenic run, if I remember, it across was. Todd's Pond and, and up through and Newbury. Pinsley, you remember Pinsley? He sure. was the operator. Sure. And he was very cooperative. Mm -hmm. So. so we lost a, a, a good opportunity there. Today you go up there and it's mostly a highway where the track used to be in many yeah. places. That's you know, I, unbelievable. I hate, I hate it, yeah. yeah. Um, when that was going on, the collection of engines was still at North Walpole. So yep. you, had the, you had the tourist railroad over here, but you mm. had the, the museum, as, as it were, over mm. here many miles away in North Walpole. So that wasn't the best kind of deal anyway. Well, that, that was short life though. The, yeah. the, the engines soon came up to North Walpole. Right. Now, yeah. I guess it was the following year, 1962, that the operation, as far as the excursion train, moved to Keene. Yes. Because I remember riding out of Keene across from Lindy's Diner. Yeah. Uh, up to, was it Mount Gilboa? Yeah. And back. Right. And that was a nice ride, and I did that many times. Yeah. I had my first cab ride there. <clears throat> um, the plan we understood at the time was to actually have the museum based in Keene. Is that correct? That's correct. And that would have corresponded to the architect's drawing that, that was in all the brochures and right. so forth. Right. Whereabouts was that plan? Was that going to be in the old shop? Yeah, area? in that area. Okay, yeah. which today is a mall. Yeah, right. Um, what happened there? Well, what happened was that Nelson got approval from the state. The, the state people were very, very pleased that this would happen and so forth. Then the Union Leader, which is a very prominent newspaper mm -hmm. in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, well, Manchester, I Manchester, guess, Manchester, Manchester New Hampshire, yeah. yeah. They, they took a dim view of it, and so they had these op-ed pages and, and got enough people against it so, so that there would be enough controversy coming into the state offices that they were afraid to, to, to touch it. So, so the whole deal fell through. The, it was almost a handshake deal that, that the state of New Hampshire would support it, help it every way possible, be part, maybe part of the national park system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it didn't happen. So basically, William Loeb, and the person of the Manchester Union leader, yeah. was the one that threw the monkey wrench into yeah. Steve yeah. Tom being in New Hampshire. Well, he, he had enough uh, political clout mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to stop it. And, and, we never could figure out why he was so opposed to it, because it would be very beneficial for the state. 
He seemed to be opposed to many things, and I know made many enemies. Yeah. Uh, he lived in Beverly, Massachusetts. Yeah, it was it was a very conservative paper. I agree oh. with a lot of things that oh. he said. You know, yeah. patriotic. But he went overboard in a lot of cases. So, for some reason, uh, he he became very disenchanted with mm -hmm. Steamtown. Isn't that a shame? Yeah. So the next year, which would have been 1963, and again I wrote it many times, they were running the train south from the North Walpole Terminal. Yeah down to a place, I guess it was East West Moreland. Yeah, right. And the turnaround was there, and I remember specifically that that run was flat as a pancake. Yeah, it through cow wasn't pasture. much scenery. No scenery, no. and I guess there was maybe one bridge they went through. Yeah. And that was it, and then it lasted there for just a year, is that correct? Yes. And then in 1964, in fact, I just got out of the Army basic training and came back and went directly to Steamtown the following day that I got home, much to my mother's displeasure. <laughs> I said, I've been waiting for this for six months. I said, yeah. I want to go up there. Yeah. So I went up there, and now they're running out of the area two miles north of Bellows Falls, a place called Riverside. Correct. And they're running on the former Rutland Railroad up to Chester Depot. Yep, correct. Um, was that, at that point in time, 1964, envisioned as the final site for the Steamtown collection was in that area known as Riverside? Yeah, if indeed Nelson could get title of that property, mm -hmm. which he did ultimately, I think the final title came after his death, and I, and I had with the, the attorney in uh, Tom, uh, Tom Sam. He later became governor, okay. and he represented Nelson quite a bit. Was the political climate in Vermont a lot more welcoming than New Hampshire had been? Yeah, at that time. At that time. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So this would have been a... a although, although the political climate in New Hampshire was excellent in, in, until the monkey until wrench... Until the monkey wrench from yeah, the right. Manchester yeah, Union leader. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. And once they got into Vermont, and of course the collection for a while was still across the river at North Walpole. Yes. And then around 1965 and 66, they began to bring that stuff over. Yeah. They built uh, some kind of an engine facility there. They had a big turntable. There was a big, looked like a, a long... You're talking North Walpole now? I'm talking Riverside. Oh, Riverside. The big, the big shed. Nelson had that. Yep, the big know. shed that they built. Yep, um, yep. And then it fanned out around the turntable, all the locomotives right. were on display. exactly. And to me, it seemed like the weather was a never-ending problem. I mean, as soon as you get something painted, it was time to paint the next one. Oh, yeah. And by the time you got the last one, it was time to start painting the first one again. True. Because of the weather. Yeah. And also, you're on a flood plain from the river. Yeah. Um, would this have really been a successful location for this, with, with all that? Long term, I think it was doomed mm -hmm. from day one, mm -hmm. for the reason that you've already enumerated. I remember being up there one day. I was near the locomotive, Nelson was talking to somebody on the ground. The guy said, well, how are you doing up here? And I can remember this because it struck me. He said, well, we're losing about $4,000 a week, but we're having a lot of fun. <laughs> well, he didn't consider it fun to be losing $4,000 a week. Yeah, I wouldn't imagine so. I mean, even in 1964 yeah, dollars. Yeah. But that yeah. stood out, and it still does yeah. in my memory, was yeah. hearing him say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember a similar thing. We, we were taking water. He, just before he died, same year, 1967, we ran a lot of excursion trains on the New Haven Railroad. Right, and I rode one of yes. those. Yep. And so it was my job to go to the fire departments <coughs> and the make arrangements to get water. Yep. And, and once in a while, it would only be an inch and a half old, you know? Right, right. <laughs> it was, but, so, uh, so I learned, you know, to, to try to make them and, and they tap off for two hydrants if we could and so forth. But we were standing up there on top of the, of the tender, Nelson and I, water pouring in from the fire department. He looked at all these people. He said, you know, Fred, look at these guys. He said, I wish I was any one of them instead of myself because I'd be enjoying it without having to pay the bills. So that that yep. stood out in my that's mind. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah that is, and that was the, uh, what was it, the Pacific number 127. That's correct. That he was running. Yeah, we had yep. some great times with that. Yeah. Boy, I remember we came out onto the main line and went back to Providence from down in, well, I don't know where we were, down around New London somewhere. Yeah. And that thing was just going hell's bells up that main line, and we thought we were in heaven. Yeah. Well, we're exceeding 70 miles out oh, yeah. in the engine. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And you know why? Because the road foreman of engines 
There was two of them. Billy Shove was, was, was the one that was senior road foreman for the whole railroad. Then there was a division road foreman with us, you know. Right. And so now, the, pretty soon, they can't stand it not to be running it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson's running. And so the, the, the senior man said he wants to run it. And the junior man says, I'll fire. We're still fired. Right. And, and he couldn't keep the fire up, you know. It had been a long time. Yeah. And so I, I told him, I, I said, you know, hey, the steam, finally the brakes are going to go on. Yeah. <laughs> the Dylan's guy to ease up. I can remember that well. Yeah, yeah. that was a great time. But, but the, they, they had a ball, these, these railroad men did. They, and there was one end fireman there that really helped me a lot. He, he'd been, some, you know, interesting thing, because some of, it was union situation. Mm -hmm. Everything in Steamtown is non-union. We're a bunch of non-union right, guys. Right. But these union guys treated us well. But they got paid. <clears throat> so the one fireman that was assigned to the trip had never been on a steam locomotive. And it, never mind fired one. Right. Never been on one. So he gets up there, <laughs> I can remember, and he says to Nelson, where the hell's the fire? <laughs> and Nelson said, you know what? Everybody talks about hell, but nobody wants to go there. So now he comes, you know, even evangelist from, from the word go after he was a believer. Right. Wow, that's mm -hmm. funny. That's yeah. a great story. Yeah. Uh, at the same period of time, uh, he started the Green Mountain Railroad. Is that correct? Yes. And that was done originally to be a freight hauler? Yes. Between... Well, and anyone that run past your trains right. too. But yeah. primarily freight between Bellows Falls well, and... Freight for the revenue. And, yeah. Yeah. And he was going to connect with the Vermont Railway at Rutland, is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did. Uh, south of Rutland. Right. You south of Rutland. Get into Rutland. Right. Yeah. How did that work originally? Did that Was that a financial success from the beginning or no? It started out pretty good because at first, the, the first national... Uh, Creamy was there. They were good five or six loads a day of milk. For, and although all he does is bring it from their siding to the B&M, mm -hmm. the, the original carry gets a certain percentage sure. of the revenue. Right. So, uh, that didn't last long. If, if, uh, might not last at all. It was, it was, but there was a lot of talc business. Oh, yeah, gassets. Yeah. yeah. So, so we had the talc business. And, and then a few, few uh, through cars, but very little. Mm -hmm. That developed later. Right. Right, and they were using, I remember, the X rutland 405, the diesel? Yes. And what else did they have for power? Was there anything else? Well, that, that was the main That was the main day. power source, yeah. Because yeah. I remember once in a while you'd, you'd get a trip even on the steam train, and, and it seems to me for a while they were running with the diesel on the rear end yep. before they had a siding to run around so they could pull it back from Chester. Yeah, right. And then there was a brief period where they had all kinds of problems with smoke ordinance, and they had to take the steamer off and put the diesel on. Yeah, that, that didn't last too that long. That didn't last, fortunately, that yeah. didn't last yeah. long. And finally, reason, you know, trumped everything right. else. Right, yeah. right. Common sense. Right. Um, now we're going to jump up to 1967, and this is the sad time. Yep. And I was on my way to my future wife's house out in... Montague, Massachusetts on Labor Day weekend, and I heard on National Public Radio that Nelson was killed in a plane crash. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I mean, here it was. I'm just driving my Camaro on Route 2, and on comes this. That was September 1st. Yep. yep he Labor was Day killed, weekend. He was killed August 31st, but nobody, nobody knew, knew until the next day. Right. Now, he was in the habit of flying his plane back and forth between yes. Steamtown and his home in Dublin. Yeah, he landed on his lawn in Dublin. Yeah, and the word we always heard was there was a problem with switching fuel tanks. Did you no. know that to be true? No, he had that problem with other planes. Okay. The problem here was he had a brand new plane, and he wasn't... The reason he bought it because you can land it at 35 miles an hour. Oh, so it's one of these short takeoff yeah. and landing. And, and, and yep. so... It, uh, and he was used to rock and so he could slip in and lose, lose altitude fast and so forth. So he wasn't used to that plane. Mm -hmm. he, and he left Steamtown on his way home. From where he was in the air, he could see his house. Right. Runs out of gas. Runs out of gas. So now he, he, he couldn't get the thing land, land dead stick because he's used to heavier planes. Mm -hmm. And this kept floating, floating. So finally... He gets to the end of this long field. He touched down. I remember we measured 88 feet. 
he, he drove it. Then they came airborne again, and hit such, there was one tree there, either side was branching, but he could have gone in there, not, not, he wouldn't have been hurt with little damage. He hit the tree head on, was decapitated. Oh. George, you know, I mean, I know that from, from the funeral director. You know, they didn't know whether to present his body. And, and, and I was with his wife, and he went, and so I knew what happened. You know, but so now there was about the reason I know he ran out again. He always kept it low to keep the weight down, so he could take off mm -hmm. off of the short runway. Yep. But he let it get too low. And so there's a couple of gallons there, but you can't use the last drop because of the attitude of the plane. Sometimes it's tipped so that you don't get... So a friend of mine, a friend of his, that's a professional pilot, went up there and looked it over. Then we saw the official report. But he did run out of gas, and the way we look at it, it was a large timing. Now, he had been a pilot for how long? Oh, 19... 46. So he, he'd been at it for some time. Oh, he, he was good. He wasn't a novice, but he, 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 oh, he was a good dead stick. He, he was never an instrument pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, always, he used, when he was flying, he used the great iron compass, yeah. which is the railroad. Which the railroad yeah. right. Yeah. right. Uh, where were you when this happened? Working at Blount Seafood. Okay. And the, 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 how I found out about it, once in a while I could come home to lunch. To this house we were living here mm -hmm. and this is one of the days I came home to, to lunch and we started at 6 a.m. Now, now new time I come home for lunch and, and my wife met me before I could get out of the truck and she said is Nelson down at Blount Seafood I said no why he said well no, they don't know where he is and so I said to myself well he took off the he, 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 I figured he was do, gone well, I didn't know. But you, you had a feeling. Yeah, right, right, immediately. Mm -hmm. So so now the next day I find out because two kids came and found them. And uh, so uh, now I've been vice president of everything that he was in. Right. Now in 10 seconds I become president right. and from number two man to number one man. Right. And, and so that night, I found out late in the day that night my goodness gracious, I lost a best friend of 33 years, number one. Number yep. two, I'm executive of the estate. All of the friends, there were a lot of problems. And all of these uh, in my lap. And, and so I'm upset and nervous about it. And tossed and turned. Then I said, hey, listen, I'm a believer. I believe in the Lord. I believe. And one day, here's what I believe. When a believer dies, He's absent from the body, present the Lord. He goes to heaven immediately. Now he's gone. I'm here. Someday the same will happen to me. We'll be together forever. And so this is just a temporary thing that was separated. And, and from that moment on, that then the, the worries were gone. The problems weren't gone. But I, I didn't worry, upset. And so that teaches me that believing the Bible, understanding it and believing it, has great uh, practical uh, results. Mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> from that time on, uh, I'm become president of Brown Seafood, president of Eater Rivera, number two man, from number one. It's much easier to be number two. You know why? Because when you're number two, you, you, you want to defer a decision, so, so you tell, like Blount's Campbell Soup, well, I'll, I'll run that by Nelson and get sure. back to you. Now I can't do that anymore. You're the man. <laughs> so the, the, Harry Truman said it right, the buck stops here. Yeah, so I had to learn how to deal with that. Were you comfortable with that? Yeah, I was comfortable after I caught on. One thing you do is say, I'll take that on an advisement and get back to you. <laughs> you know? That gives you a little while and to yeah, get that, your head to but, go. But it wasn't hard for me because Nelson was an absentee owner. Mm -hmm. I was running Blount Seafood anyway. Yeah, sure. So nothing Just changed. Just a technicality. Yeah, yeah, nothing changed except the, the responsibility. Right. Uh, Edaville, I'm totally familiar down there. And 
down there more than he was because he moved to New Hampshire. Huh? Now, where yeah. were you in the Steamtown setup at that point? Um, well, I was vice president of it, mm -hmm. and, and he, he, he ran that show, and I was along on his coattails, but I, I knew what was going on right. and, and had some uh, input, which he, any input I, I had, he respected it, didn't always agree with it. That's true. Yeah. Now, his family, he had quite a family, he had several children. Five. Yeah, and yeah. the wife. Four boys and a girl. They must have taken this terribly hard. Yeah, this was hard, but, but Ruth, Ruth took it. Uh, she, she, by t then she's a believer, and, and she took a good Christian attitude on it. And my wife was helpful to her. The youngest kids called me Uncle Fred, so so, so uh, I, I became kind of a surrogate father to the okay. youngest ones. Okay. And, you know, until they grew up, and then that passes on. <laughs> you know, right. but but uh, I spent a lot of time up there. I was running blount seafood. But uh, I would go oftentimes up to uh, Dublin to his place. His wife was very good to my wife and I would use the master bedroom. She'd go someplace else and did. see there were problems there. there were, he'd borrow money. Uh, his kids owned the engine house in North Walpole. He'd borrow money. think people thought he was fabulously rich, but but he doled out a lot of money, you know. And, and it, it wasn't an endless supply, right? Right. So I had to get a lot of details. I had to work on, mm -hmm. and then there was difficulties with a lease at Steamtown. And some people claimed that he agreed to do this and that. And then he started getting bills. The bank foreclosed. He borrowed money for for t ten freight cars, and borrowed money. The bank foreclosed on Blount Seafood. Oh. You know? Which lasted about an hour because that, you know, I say, hey, listen, <laughs> are you guys serious? I mean, some lawyer does this, and you've dealt with me how many years? Mm -hmm. huh? So, so a lot of things to work out. Now, where did Bob Adams fit into all this? Was he strictly Green Mountain Railroad? Yeah, uh, what what we did was sold the Green Mountain Railroad but only under the provision that Bob Adams had to own over 50% of the stock because Nelson had a lot of confidence in him. Okay. He'd been Nelson's right-hand man. And, and so later on we had, had to change, and I had to, uh, as executive of the state, uh, uh, adapt to some things so that they could get rid of that stock. But, but he wanted Nelson, uh, Bob Adams to be running the show. Okay. And he was the right man to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, as far as Steamtown itself, I know the next 16 years or so were pretty tough years. Uh, yeah. Um, there was always a problem with money. Did Nelson not leave that endowed properly, or what was the deal? Yeah, and the, and the, it, it was endowed with no money, but all the equipment went a, a year or two at a time, you know, to to uh, the Steamtown Foundation. Steam. Foundation was a beneficiary of the equipment, but of zero cash. Okay, so there was no money. No. So they had to raise money. Yes. From then on. Yeah. Uh, both through, obviously, through. I don't imagine the fares would have paid for the existence of the railroad. No. No. So they had to have other other sources of funding. How did that come in? Well, donations. Donations. Yeah, mm -hmm. there were people that donated substantial amounts that really had an interest in it. Uh, borrowed money. Uh, sold a little equipment here and there. What about the town of Bellows Falls? Were they behind it or did they not have any money to put into it? Well, they liked it, but, but they didn't have money to put okay. Nobody had money to stay, okay. nobody. Okay, so yeah. you weren't getting any funding from government sources whatsoever? No, not that I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, I remember the name Edgar T. Mead. Yes. Uh, Edgar Mead was the last what is it, manager of the Bridgeton and Harrison? Yes, so-called superintendent. Superintendent or whatever when yeah. he was in, in college. Yeah. So right. I, I know he's... He was a junior in college. Yeah, he dates back to those those days, and yeah. he was involved with the foundation at some point. Is that correct? Yeah. He, he, he was the, the son of a millionaire, you okay. know, and especially his wife. She was loaded with money. Mm -hmm. And so Nelson, <clears throat> at the end there, 
was planning to step down as chairman. Mm -hmm. it, this was starting to weigh on him some, you know, all this responsibility and so forth. And, and he was so interested in becoming an evangelist, that was number one. Mm -hmm. Steamtown was important, but being an evangelist was more important to him. So he was planning to step down. So he had the idea, he went down to New York, spent some time. Edgar Mee was, was a broker, you know, down in New York. Yes. And he, he made some money doing that, but his main support was inherited money, mm -hmm. it, it appeared to me. But Edgar Mee said, figured, had Nelson believe, and I think Edgar was sincere and believed in himself, that he had a lot of contacts and he could raise money and he could get funding and all this. And, and so Nelson was thinking of stepping down and Edgar would come over because he represented big money interests, right. or appeared to, at least. So now, Nelson dies, everybody says to me, well, you should be, take his place. And I said, I got Blount Seaford, I got Edivo Railroad, I got, and Nelson had decided probably he stepped down while he's alive in Edgar Mead. So in a real sense, that Edgar Mead was Nelson's choice in advance of who should continue in his stead. Mm -hmm. So I told everybody that would be my vote, and so they agreed. And he came and ran it. We found out he didn't have much money to put in. <laughs> I was going to say, because I don't remember a whole lot of progress going no. on when he was there. No, Joe, Joe. But he, he was a, a good, sincere guy, I think. But, but in the meantime, he'd been sued. He got into some trouble. You probably read it in the yeah. paper down yeah. there. Yeah. And so that, that didn't help his image any. So now, you know, it's in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> some detrimental things yep. about him, so, yeah. so he didn't raise much money, and so it didn't last too long. Yeah, because it was always seems like it was one crisis after another. Yeah. Now the the Bob Barbera, or is it? Yeah. How, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, and that's his, the way I pronounce yep, it. And his father, yeah, Andy, came, Andy came into the picture. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Where did they come from? Oh, was well, there? Andy was a, a man that loved railroads. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and he loved steam engines, and he'd run a steam engine most of his life on the Lackawanna Railroad. Right. And so, somebody got a hold of him, it might have been Ed Mead, I don't remember, well, all at once he shows up. And so now, he, he wants to become senior engineer because he's had all this experience and so forth. We had a lot of guys that, that, that run an engine as good as he could, mm -hmm. but because of uh, prestige that comes from coming outside, he, he ran the engines a lot, and he was a good guy. Mm -hmm, he was. So, so what, where did his father come from? All at once he shows up out of the woodwork, and he said, my father is here, and I'm interested in, in, in his latter days, if they're good, so I'm going to volunteer and help you raise money and, and run the show. And he did. And he, he had a lot of ability. And, and, and so now he acts as a volunteer. Next thing you know, he wants to be the paid guy that, that's a chairman, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that happened. And it started out pretty good and deteriorated rapidly. Yeah, I know that the BM Historical Society had several people that were volunteering up there at that time. Yeah. I was in the society, but I never was a volunteer up there. But I remember being the editor of the bulletin, and I remember correspondence with people that had worked up there, and um, several people in particular, uh, a fellow named David Hutchinson and his father Leroy Hutchinson, were yeah. both very active up there. Right, yeah. And they didn't get along with Barbera at all. No. And, uh, well, know finally that. got so none of us did. Mm -hmm. At the end there, he became very arbitrary. So if, if I'm going to continue to be uh, the manager, uh, and then I, I've got to have this this money. Uh, if anybody comes disenchanted with me, then, then they've got to pay me for 10 years. And he came up with re ridiculous, I don't know why. And we said, if that's the way you feel, we'll get somebody else. So that was the end of him. Mm -hmm. Now, was this about the same time they began to look around to, to move Steamtown elsewhere? Well, Nelson was thinking about it a little bit, but, but that didn't really come about uh, full bloom until uh, 
what's his name that wrote all those? Bob uh, Ball. Oh, uh, Don Ball. Came. Don Ball, yes. You know, Don Ball came. Now, now he'd been with Ross Rowland. Right. You know, in, in the American Freedom Train, and and we had done business with Ross Rowland. Uh, you know, the, the 127 went down there on, on high high and high, a high number trips, of times, yep. mm -hmm. and and, and Ro Ross had to deal with me after Nelson's gone. Right. <laughs> right. And, and and we got along and and, lived, and so. Uh, Don Ball knew him well. He represented a lot of money. He made a lot of money in gold futures. And he's a smart guy, yep. right? and a good locomotive engineer. He had a lot of things going for him. So he died young too. Is he? Is he he's dead? He's gone many years. Don Ball. Yeah. No, Don Ball. I'm, I'm talking about Ross. Oh, Rowland. Ross Rowland. No, he's still around, yeah, but he doesn't seem to be active much. Anymore. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so anyway, no, Don Ball. Died at age 49, yeah. same as Nelson Blount, yeah. same age, 49. Yeah. So, so Don Bull said that he had a love-hate relationship with uh, <clears throat> Roland, you know, and, and knew a lot about it and so forth. And so we thought he was going to raise a lot of money. He did a lot of good things. He didn't raise very much money. But then he figured, well, what we got to do is to move it, and there's people that would love to finance it if it was in their territory. So we, you, you asked me at another time, when we look at another play, we looked at in New Haven a lot, mm -hmm. in, in the old engine facilities there, uh, looked at uh, Florida some, but finally Scranton came and, and really, <clears throat> with great salesmanship, came and said, you come down here, you got everything you want. We'll support you financially, and we've got the engine house. We've got everything you need down here, and the, the mayor was very, very cooperative. And Don Ball wanted to go there, and so we did, and and it started out pretty well down there, but still, it you know, it takes so much money to maintain a steam engine. Even cosmetically, mm -hmm. if you're going to maintain it operationally, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, at least. So, so now we go down there, and pretty soon we're running out of money. And so one of the new board members had a contact politically with a representative in the Congress. Can't think of his name right now, but it'll come to me. And so he decided that it would be good for his constituents if Steamtown stayed down there. And so he made arrangements for it to be taken over by the Park Service. Right. And so that's, that's how that happened. I'm, I was down there in his office two or three times in Washington, so I. I was an observer of how this came about. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people uh, in, at the uh, different museums across the country said this a lousy deal and the government shouldn't do this. And it got a lot of criticism. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Now, wasn't one of the reasons they wanted to move Steamtown out of New England was because of the short season, because of the long winters? Yeah, that, that was one of them. But the main one was lack of funding. Lack of funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, jumping from Steamtown uh, briefly, what was going on at Edaville during all this time? Well, in 1967, Nelson Blount was killed in his plane, as we've already gone over. So I ran it until 1970. I became president of Edaville for mm -hmm. that period of time. In the meantime, the family decided they don't want Edaville. Ted Blount had come with a company, and that Nelson had said, uh, I was a trustee of a fund that he had, and we were told as trustees, if any of Nelson, by him, anyone wanted to come into any company that he had a major financial interest in, that have him come in, but don't give it to them on a silver platter. So that was legal terms where I said they, they got to earn their way in there. So when Ted decided to come, I set up an apprentice schedule for him in mind with what Nelson had said. So 
So he had to do every job in the place, which included Edaville. Well, he decided he didn't want to do Edaville, which is okay. So now the family instructed me to sell it. I, I, I own Zoo in it, but I, I became the person that sold it. I sold it for the family to George Bartholomew. reason I did that, Nelson, in my presence, had agreed with George that if he ever sells it, George Bartholomew would have the same, would have the first shot at it. Okay. So Nelson was friendly and sympathetic to George Bartholomew's cause for a number of reasons, and I knew firsthand that if it sold, it would be pleasing to Nelson if George bought it. So with that in mind, I had a moral obligation, and so made it easy for him to buy it, uh, you know, and he did. Now, was his background, um, someone told me that he used to fire the locomotives at Edaville? Yeah, that's true. As a teenager? Yeah. And that he, he himself became sort of an entrepreneur by starting a string of car washes. That's true. And from the money that he made in, in these enterprises that he began. That's where he got the funding to purchase Edaville, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's partly correct. Mm -hmm. Plus, I gave him a, a long term to pay off the debt okay. uh, out, out of profits from Edaville. Okay. Um, what was Bartholomew's background other than that he was a rail fan? Well, his, his father, he came from a, a wealthy family. Okay. And his family owned a lot of cranberry bars, which at one time were cash machines. They, they fell into bad times once in a while, but <clears throat> so they owned a lot of bar and they had quite a lot of money. But uh, they expected him to to, to support himself. He, he wasn't uh, pampered in any okay. way, to the best of my knowledge. He was a worker. Okay. Yeah. Um. After having Edaville for a few years, the word has it that he was skimming money out of the Edaville operation and putting into some of his other. Well, I wouldn't say skimming money. Well, okay, <laughs> you know, say investing no, some no, of the money. No. <clears throat> My comment on that is that I'm disappointed in some of the financial decisions he made because Edaville was making money. Right. We had a hundred thousand or better every Christmas. Right. You know, and so he could have, it could still be there, but he made decisions, which was his right. He owned it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And he made decisions, and I'm not second guessing him. I, we and I, he and I discussed at the time. I'm not saying anything about him. In fact, I discussed it within a week with him over the phone. He's out in Arizona. Mm -hmm. the, the the things that could have been different, but he says. The water is over the dam. We can't go back. Life goes on. Don't worry about it. No. He, he, he feels like a failure in the railroad business. Yeah, because he had an episode out at the Cumbries and Toltec. Correct. Which left them very upset. Correct. Yeah, so he's not had a very great track record, not to make a pun. Yeah, um, true. Well, that's a good one, tra track record. <laughs> yeah. Did... did uh, the fact that Edaville closed in 1991, and, and even at the time when we were there, at Christmas of 1991, there was a sign that said, we'll see you in the spring of 92. Yeah. Did they know that they weren't going to be able to, to open it again? Well, I think that, that, that was Rick Knight and Paul Hallett primarily. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they've got some backing from Jack Flagg and a few others. It looked like things were going to go. And then there the, the, the came some personality conflicts, not only there, but with people that they were doing business with and so forth. And a lack of funding that had probably been, at least by inference, promised. And so they were unable to go on. Right. Now there was something, there was a group called Cran Rail. That was them. That was them. Okay. Yeah. Because right. yeah. I know I heard stories at the time. In fact, somebody even came to me and asked me if I wanted to put some money into it. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, I'd have to know a lot more about what, I mean, yeah. it seemed real loosey-goosey. Yeah, right. Yeah. And not something you'd want to no, put. No, it, it wasn't well organized financially, but it was okay. well organized uh, as far as, as being able to keep the, the equipment going. Once they finally got, I guess it was flagged that, that two other people yeah. uh, got the 
railroad up and running again in the mid 90s or the yeah. late 90s. Uh, they made a whole bunch of changes, as, as you know. Yeah. Um, some of which a lot of people think didn't add to it at all. Um, essentially, as you just mentioned earlier, off the record, it's not a railroad anymore. It's no, a, it's, you, it's a park you, with a train ride. Right. right. Yeah. Like sort of like Pleasure Island was. Yeah. Um, right. And now with the cosmetically, it looks better than it's ever oh, looked absolutely. in its history. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess what I want to ask is. Had you been able to go back, or if you had any desire to go back and reopen the railroad, how would you have done it? Well, I wouldn't have to reopen it. It would never have been closed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What improvements or changes would you have made to it to update it to what people would expect of, a, of an attraction today? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it would, it would never have closed because Blount Seafood still own it. Right. And Blount Seafood was willing in the bad years to, to fund it. Okay. So, so we always paid our bills. If, if there was a, a discount for, for early payment, we always got them. George got to where he was paying so late that everything was COD. Right. You know? And so, so either will, if Brown Seafood could continue to own it, I'm pretty sure it would have been running to this day as it was running in, in that day. So we wouldn't have to change anything as far as the physical plan is concerned. How would we market it different? We, we had some pretty good marketing people mm -hmm. that helped us. We had, well, <coughs> the first real fans day was Edaville. Yes. And it was my idea. Not to chat, the real fans came free, the yeah. first one. Yeah. It, was, it was to thank the real fans, not to make money off right. of them. And so we had real fans day because of volunteers that helped us. Then some of these volunteers had a lot of good input, and so, so, so we had a day where guys would chop wood, sawmill. We we, we had antique car days. Yep. We and we would continue that type of thing because it was successful and was mutually beneficial. When anything's mutually beneficial, it works because both sides profit. That's right. And so we had a lot of people that wanted to come in. And we had country music day with. And so we would have continued that way. And we had good advice from marketing people, and they would continue to, to help us. We didn't claim to be marketing people. We learned some things. Mm -hmm. so, so would we reopen it? No, we would never close it. Right. right. Where was the Atwood estate in all of this? They still own the property at that time? Oh, yeah. The whole time. Do they still, or has it been bought out? No, it's been bought out okay. in its entirety. Okay, so they have no connection anymore. No. Okay. When all the equipment was uh, moved to Portland, yeah, and they had the antique trucks and everything yeah. come down, that was quite an escapade. We got tape of it coming up Route 99. Right. Sad, sad day for yeah, us. Yeah, I, I viewed that with mixed feeling at the time. I thought, well, it's good it's been saved, but I could already see it was the end of an era. Yeah, it wasn't saved. It was it was moved, let's yeah, say that. It was, right. it was not saved, it was moved. The stuff is deteriorating Terrible. for the most part. Yep. Yeah. Um, there was big talk at the time that the Portland company was going to fund a lot of that. I don't yeah. see any great amount of funding coming from them. No. Um, they have one building up there in which some of the better equipment is in. Right. Um, other than that, uh, they're repairing engines in a, in a boathouse under a plastic canopy, yeah, yeah. which sad, is so, so small you can barely get in between the engine well, and the wall. We water. had a beautiful engine house, well equipped. Wasn't know. that engine house at Edaville basically what came from Bridgeton? A lot of it. The machine shop yeah. and, and pretty right. much everything that was at Bridgeton yeah. was in that engine house, and that's yeah. all gone today as well. Yeah, as and, and other things that Peter Career <coughs> was able to, to get. You, you know, we, we were very fortunate, Edaville, to have a master mechanic that could do anything and was not a prima donna. He was a humbug. Some guys can do anything and they know it and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they become, you know, a, a negative effect. Yep. Pete, he's a master, a, a professional welder, a high blood, high pressure welder. Because he worked in a shipyard. Sure. Yeah. He's a diesel man. He's a carpenter. He's an electrician. 
and, and he can do everything. Right. And and so in the early days when we came, he, he he's a Cape Verdean, born in this country, right. but so they look at themselves as black people. Right. You know? And so I tell people I go to his house, we become very friendly. I'd rather eat off the floor of his house than off the dangling table. A lot of people I know, you know, yep. he's, and he keeps his shop that way. So when we first came down there, he, he said, you know, us guys, we figured you wouldn't be used to us and we wouldn't last down here, you know. Right. And But in spite of that, he told us everything he knew. Some of them withheld him, you know, they figured, if they tell us what they know, then we'll know and we'll get rid of them. Peter was the opposite. He told us everything, you know. Now, was he there in the Atwood days? Yes, yeah. he, he worked on the box first. Oh, okay. And then, then was transferred to the railroad. So, so he's a bog man. He can operate a bog. Right. You know, you know. So anyway, a, when the first came down there, that would never would, would, would have the, the, the Puerto Ricans or, or the Cape Verdeans be an engineer. They had to be firemen. Right. Now, now we promote them to engineer, you know. And what I'm getting at is, in those days, that was in the 50s, then there were still a lot of active railroad men that knew steam locomotives. So we hired this guy that, that had been a, a locomotive repairman. And he shows Pete how to time the engines, mm -hmm. do all these things. And the interesting thing is, they show Pete today, and tomorrow he can do it better than they can. He, he's just got that real innate, fast study. That, yeah, that yeah. innate, and he studied. It was so, and he would learn a lot of tricks, you know, of the trade. Mm -hmm. and, and so he, reason I mention all this, it was because of his expertise, his faithfulness, that we ran. Sometimes 10,000 people a night w with no failures. That's amazing. Yeah. If there is a failure, he'd fix it yeah. quick. Uh, yeah. I've had injectors fail. I come in, Peter's got another one already. Because in advance, he figures out what could go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, while I'm at, at the stage, we change injectors, or he does. Well, well that was typical of everything that he did. And so I can't say enough good things about Peter Career. Is he still around? He, he's alive, retired, mm -hmm. 80 years old. Yeah, I remember him very well. I was in his house last week. Good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Um, what do you think about the other two narrow gauge uh, museums up in Maine, the, the Wiscasset Waterville operation and the Sandy River operation at Phillips? Well, the Sandy River, I'm familiar with that area because. In 1935, Nelson Blount and I visited the Sandy River for the first time. And probably about the last time. It, no, the 36. Yeah. The 35 had been abandoned. I got pictures I took, and, and they got pictures of me that they took, of all the engine house doors open. The 10th tall engine house in Phillips. Mm -hmm. We opened all to make it look like it was still active. Right. Uh, but So now we, we were upset with all that. Abandonment. Uh, it sold for twenty thousand two hundred dollars. You know that. Yeah. We wrote a letter to Henry Ford, asked him to buy. It had been five or ten more years. Nelson could have bought sure. twenty thousand two hundred. They were selling engines for two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. 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 Number twenty four. Yeah. So, so, and that parlor car. Yeah. What fifty bucks? I yeah. Think, yeah. So, so, but anyway, what went with it? A engine house, a shop so complete you could build a little. A car shop, you know, probably 300 miles of rail, not 300 miles of track, right. but 300 miles of rail. Right. All the passenger cars, freight cars, property. It was unbelievable. You know who finally got it? Japan. Salzburg, beneath the scrap man. Yeah, but it went to Japan, came Japan. Back, back as shrapnel. Yeah. 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 A sad, sad thing. Well, Henry Ford was good enough to answer a, a letter. And I can remember what he said in essence. He said, I got plenty of money, I could afford it, but I've got other uses that's more important to me to use now. But at least he answered it. At least he answered it, yeah. yeah. So now they've restored, what, three quarters of a mile of track in Phillips, the other side yeah. of the river. Right. They've built the old stone fort 
Oh, well, they, well, they got a six-stall engine yep, house. they built that. Uh, I think highly of them, but the one I think mostly hi hi highly of is the Wiscasset Waterville and Farming, which is run 100% by volunteers. Mm -hmm. And so amazing, as I mentioned before, none of them are prima donnas. They all work together. It's unbelievable that this would continue year in and year out. Yep. Nobody gets paid, and yep. everything gets done. And they have a fabulous success rate. Yeah. Everything they claim they want to do, they do. Yeah, yeah. And then they publicize it and they say, look, we, you gave us this amount of money, and we did this, we yeah. did this, and we did this. And every month the newsletter comes out, yeah. and that's the glue that keeps those places together. Yeah, every other month. Yeah, every yeah. other month. And, and, it, and they show you in pictures for people that can't get there yeah. where your money went. Well, what, what, what a good newsletter they put out. They do. Right? I look forward to yeah. reading it. Yeah. It's on quality paper. I, yep. I got them all. I, I've saved them. I, I've made a book out of them. I right. think I'll bind them. Right, they are. They're excellent. And yeah. and the people that write the articles, like Ellis Walker, that does the musings. Yeah, yeah I like fabulous that. Fabulous stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, jumping back to Nelson Blount for a minute. Uh, he was he had his conversion to Christianity. I guess that was after his wife's terrible accident. Yes, it was. Um, after that, he was endlessly preaching to anyone who would listen, yeah, and even those who wouldn't. Exactly. Um, a lot of people resented that. Yeah, I was uh, one of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you think that in the long run that made a whole lot of difference in, in the way people thought about him or felt about him? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you why. A lot of people resented that, but then... He wore well. They could see that he was it was genuine thing. He was really in their best interest, even though they didn't agree with it. So, after a while, they saw it because of the of, of the authenticity of it. You might say right. that it was respected for the most part. Right. Now he actually had a coach up in the yards at, at Riverside. Yeah. With a little, it's almost like a chapel. Yeah. True. Had his tracts and pamphlets and what have you right. in there. Um, okay. I remember that very well. Yeah. How did the average tourist take to that sort of thing? M most of them respected it. Okay. A, a few squawked about it, but, but a very small minority. Then, then after he died, uh, Ruth Blount wanted to have a testimonial film done that gave his testimony and people could come. I don't know if you ever did that. I did. And so, and so he, she went, went down to... Uh, about Jones College, and they said it cost seventy-five thousand dollars. And so Bill Vickman and I, we, we knew a, a radio announcer up, a TV announcer up in Boston. But I've forgotten his name right now. And so he was sympathetic to this case. <coughs> so we put together with his help, or, or he put it together without little help from us, uh, a film. But I, I got a copy of it. Uh, on a VCR now that, that cost $3,000. And, and that was what we used up there, and at Edaville too. Right. And for a couple of years. Right. And, and, and with quite a bit of success. Right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, if Nelson had lived, we've already covered a little bit about that, but where do you think Edaville and Steamtown would have gone? Do you think you've already mentioned? They were thinking about moving. Do you think it would have moved? Uh, would it have become part of the National Park Service? Do you think, or would would Nelson have kept it himself? Or all right, the answer, as I see it, either of would still be there. Okay. Uh, Steam Town would be gone, long gone, and to some other location, possibly in his day to Florida. Mm -hmm. He had some land down there that was available to him under certain circumstances that, that he was quite enamored with. Right. Uh, probably it wouldn't have gone to the Park Service, but because we didn't know any... We only learned about them through political c connections in Scranton. But if it had gone to Florida, there was some pretty good money that would have helped out with it. And, uh, and Nelson w would be somewhat other there'll be a foundation with other people supporting it besides Nelson. Right. So the question would it still be uh, here, yeah, the answer is I think yes, but Nelson would be 
only a small part of it. I but Edivo would still be here, and he'd be the major part of that. Right. right. Now, how old would he be where he's still alive today? He would, if, well, I'm 88, he would be 87. Boy, that's hard to believe. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's like frozen in time. Yeah. At 49. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're almost done. Um, we pretty much covered the Steamtown at Scranton aspects. Um, the only thing really left to ask you is, how is your life these days? What are you What are you doing? Well, I, I had a heart attack, a major heart attack this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was on my back in a hospital for four weeks. When you come out like that, you're weak as can be. I can hardly walk. So I've had to regain a lot of strength, which I've done. It's a some of the medications changed my voice a little bit. They're working on that. Right, right. Uh, so, in general, I feel pretty good. Uh, I'm weak. I, a lot of times I have to sit down and, and so forth. But physically, uh, I'm recovering. And it appears the strength is going to be not like it was, but reasonable. I have to tell you, you look terrific. Yeah, well, thank you. And you seem like you're right at the top of your game. Yeah, well, well it, it hasn't affected but my thinking yet, at my age, <laughs> sometimes they used to call it senility, now it's Alzheimer's. Yeah, right, right. they have a name for it, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but so far, and, and uh, I have, I'm pretty active. Uh, I spend a little time at Brown Seafood. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I uh, spend a lot of time, I have a home Bible class, non-denominational, every Monday night. Mm -hmm. I have another one uh, every Wednesday. So I have to prepare for that, well, do for, and there's people that have questions, and I have some of the answers. If I don't have the answers, I got friends that know more than I do, and I, I get them. So, so that, that keeps me pretty busy. Then my wife has, has had very serious back surgery, and, and so uh, I'm trying to be, she's a caregiver to me, but I'm trying to be a caregiver to her. It's a partnership. And, and, uh, yes, yeah. and it's been a partnership for 61 years. So, so uh, I, and now, right now, we're going to move, and so what I'm doing is, is downsizing. Right. I had 800 railroad books. I got to cut it down to 300. I've cut it down to to 600. That's you tough. Know. I can empathize with that. Yeah, and, and but you know, I found out <clears throat> that a few more duplicates, but a lot of it's not duplicates. You know, overrun each other. Mm -hmm. and so. I don't need 26 books about the real Grand Southern, you yeah, know. That's true. So, so, and when when you get rid of them, it only hurts for 10 minutes. After <laughs> you get rid of them, then you forget about them. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's absolutely true. So, and we've got to downsize, you know, most everything. Right. right. So, so that, that's taken time. But uh, you said when you retire, they have lots of time. I found since I retired, I've got less. I don't know how I ever had time to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, last but not least, what in your life has uh, given you the greatest pleasure, do you think? Well, my marriage, that's my wife over there, we, we, we've had a great marriage. Thank you. And, we, we, and, and besides that, I'm, I'm very thankful to Nelson Blount. He explained to me how to become a believer. And what the, the, everybody's going to spend... The, the future, either in heaven or hell, according to the Bible, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I learned how to make the right decision so I can be comfortable with that, and, and that's a great decision that gives me comfort, even in the midst of the many difficulties that we have. That's a wonderful philosophy. I yeah. think Nelson would be happy to see that the seed, yeah, you would. The seed certainly took here. Yeah, yeah. right. Fred, thank you so much for being with us today. And, yeah, you're welcome. And having us here in your lovely home. Yeah. And uh, could we have your good wife come over here for a second and get in the picture? Sure. No. Yeah, oh, come on. Yeah, come on over. She looks great. Yeah. Oh, I do not. Just watch yeah. the wires. Yeah. I don't go for, for the... I like dresses. I was raised up on good dresses. Oh, I know. Dresses. That's right. Yeah. I don't That's like right. these either, but here well, you are. Well, i got to take these in the middle of a... I mean, the whole... <laughs> This, this, this is the Kuman Patrol, you know. Oh my! I don't. So anyway, that's why, that's why I'm bleeding like a horse all the time and taking that stupid stuff. You, you, you know, the blood doesn't stop running. Nothing heals. Yeah, no clotting. Yeah, no yeah. clotting. Yeah.
Again, Fred, thank you so much for yeah, being with us. Okay. And we, hope, yeah. we wish you many, she, she, many... She gets behind so you won't know she no. doesn't have a dress on. Okay. <laughs> we, we wish you both many more years of happiness. And, yeah, uh, thank uh, you. you.